Good morning, church. Oh, you know what we need this Christmas is a little peace. <laughs> if you have children in your house, you have peace, but it's of a different kind. <laughs> it's a kind of a chaotic peace, I guess. Oh, I hope you're having a, a good a good holiday. And today, I've just we're just going to want to get get centered in the things that are really important. Get centered in uh, in Jesus. His arrival on earth, how wonderful that is, how miraculous it is. I want to thank Lee Mackey and Kale and Kyle for doing such a terrific job this morning. The singing is awesome. I join with Kale. Congratulations, you guys. The Lord is the Lord's pleased when we make a beautiful, not just a joyful noise, but also a beautiful one. And welcome to our online audience as well. As well. We're glad that you're with us. God is good. All the time? You bet. All the time. <clears throat> now, <laughs> if uh, I'm going to pose something to you here. <clears throat> if, I were, if I were God, okay, if I were God, I think I would have done his birth a little differently. Don't you? Uh I would have changed the birthplace of Jesus to uh, some place more famous like Jerusalem or Rome. He wasn't born there. He wasn't born in Corinth. He was born in Bethlehem. In fact, we wouldn't even know where Bethlehem was. In fact, we never would have heard of it if Jesus hadn't been born there. Because I could point out, you know, there are several cities in Palestine that were very large that are not mentioned in the New Testament at all. Isn't that interesting? Not mentioned at all. And yet, Bethlehem, this little one-horse town, you know, just, wow. I mean, what happened? We got this little town, and we all know all over the world. We know what Bethlehem is famous for. And, 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 and a, in, a, in a stable, in a cave, or whatever it was that, where, where that he was born, a, a manger, a feeding trough? Come on. We can do better than that, can't we, God? Uh, how about a sterile birthing environment for Joseph and Mary and nurses and the best doctors on the planet? How's that? Mary goes unexpectedly into labor, so it's not like they induced. It just happened. And it happened while they were out of town. They were away from home because of the Roman government telling them to go to a certain place, their hometown, to, so they could be counted, so that they could be taxed. And uh, if I were God, I would have uh, eliminated Herod before Jesus' birth. Do you know Herod the Great died about eight years after Jesus was born? We know that from history. He, was, he, was, he died in 6 A.D. We figure Jesus was born around 3 to 4 A.D. So if, if the Lord could have just taken him out 10 years sooner, maybe you wouldn't have had such a paranoid result when the wise men went to, this, to Herod and Herod decided because they were looking for the king of the Jews that I'm going to eliminate my rival. And so he kills all the babies in the environs of Bethlehem. Baby boys, two years and under. Why didn't the Lord just take them out? And if, and if I were God, I would have chosen three priests instead of astrologers. By the way, the, ta the, uh, the text doesn't tell us how many wise men, magi there were. It just says that they took three gifts, but we don't know how many wise men, magi, but they were probably astrologers. It says they're from the east. Ah, they're not Jews. They're superstitious. They study the stars. It's how they notice the star. And how in the world is it that God revealed to these pagans that the son of God, the, the king of the Jews would be born where this star was. How did that happen? 
Wouldn't we want a Levite, a priest, some well-known person from Judaism, a great rabbi, to have this revealed to him? And yet, this is done by a group of folks from the East, the mystical religions. But, but I'm not God, and it's a good thing, because I have a carnal mind. I don't have the mind of the Spirit like God does. He was thinking of other things. Jesus' birth was very much like our own. You see, most of you don't know where I was born. And you'd probably forget if I told you. Uh, Jesus was born in a place where we'll never forget. And there was unrest, anger, violence, and disease. Most of us don't live in palaces we live in houses. We are relatively unknown except to our families, except for a few folks who have fame. But most of us, we're pretty much unknown to the world. And Jesus came like we all do. The pain of mothers in childbirth and the messiness of family life and dirty diapers and the chaos of, of politics and disease and violence at that particular time and a dirty house, in this case, a stable or a cave. <laughs> Jesus came as one of us. He came near. Interestingly, <clears throat> God did not stop the merry-go-round for his son to get on. Very humble of our Father in heaven, very humble, that he inserted his son and life did not stop. It went on. The announcement of his birth was glorious, but it was only to a few. You know, actually, some of us have reveal parties about the genders of our babies for more people than Jesus was announced to. <laughs> you see, when God did his reveal, it was very exclusive and to people that weren't really all that reputable, not famous, not credible. Shepherds were not considered credible witnesses. Jesus came humbly in every way. Only a few expected him, and when they found the Savior, there was rejoicing and anticipation. Today's passages that were read, and thank you, Cale, for doing that, were about anticipation, about hope, about what's coming, you know, what, what's, what's coming now. That, you know, I, I've waited for family members to arrive from out of town like we all have. We've waited for hours. Uh, the Jews waited for centuries for their Messiah, their Savior to come. That's a long wait. The weary world rejoiced. It was a tired world, tired of waiting. Then Christ comes in the most unexpected way, in the most unexpected place, to the most unexpected people, witnessed by ordinary folks. And what God did in doing that was to remove any barrier that you might feel between him and the divinity and the majesty of Jesus, his son, so that he would be approached by us common folk. So that there would not be wealth that would stand and intimidate us, that we could get near this Savior and have a relationship with him. So he came like one of us. I'm glad he did. Because when we speak of him to others, church, when we speak of him to others, he's the glorious son, but he's also a regular person too. For whom the world did not stop for him to be born. The world just kept turning. The merry-go-round did not stop just to let the Son of God on. He was, God ran up alongside the merry-go-round and placed his child in the middle of all that movement. Humble, our Father. Humble arrival, the Son of God. Let's look at Philippians 4. And uh, it's in one of the texts that we want to read today. 4 through 7. Because this is application to all this. Okay, and I'll explain in a moment. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. 
Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. We hear that a lot at church. <laughs> but what in the world does that mean? I mean, how is that possible? Does that mean that in every situation we should rejoice? Uh, does this mean that if I'm suffering, I ought to rejoice? Does this passage mean that I will have an inner peace that carries us through difficult times? I, I want to answer that question. I think you know the answer to that question, but I, I want you to return to Christ's birth again. What was happening at the time of Jesus' birth? At this time when the angels rejoiced, the Jews had been subjugated by the Roman Empire, something they hated. At the same time of Jesus' glorious birth, there were false messiahs who had already come and led little revolutions and had died. Thirdly, there 400 years had passed from the last time a prophet wrote about God. God was pretty much silent there from Malachi to Matthew. A paranoid, fourthly, a paranoid Herod had butchered baby boys just before Jesus' arrival or around that time, afraid that a rival would unseat him. Christ's coming was not in a vacuum. His arrival will be in the midst of the chaos, and rejoicing comes in the midst of the chaos. Because that's the way Jesus came. The angels and Joseph and Mary and those magi and those shepherds at night they rejoiced in the midst of the chaos of the time. The, even Jesus himself would be threatened by Herod and would have to flee to Egypt. I mean, where's the rejoicing in all of that? Because the Lord was working for good. Rejoice in the Lord always because the Lord has always got some plan that he's working for your good and my good. Rejoice in the Lord always. He says, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. In Christ, the Lord is always near. We don't have to beg down to beg God to come down from heaven. He's already sent his son, left his spirit. He's right here. And Rejoice. Rejoice in that. Our rejoicing, is not, our rejoicing is not for the anticipation of what will happen, but our rejoicing is the great anticipation is now reality. It's arrived. Jesus has come. And he is coming back. And that all ties together. The Lord is near, therefore rejoice. And the Apostle Paul said it, rejoice in the Lord. He said it a second time, rejoice. And again I say, rejoice. And since the Christ child's coming came in the most unconventional way, we must understand that the nearness of Jesus also comes in unconventional ways. We expect to find Jesus in church, and you can find him here. But do you know when I talk to people about where they find Jesus, where they find him? It's not in a building. They find him at a cemetery. They find him in a hospital. They find him in a loving teacher. They find him in a mentor. They find him in the night, in bed. They find him in any number of ways. He's here, but sometimes... He's more real when he meets us where we live. We expect to find Jesus in the good deeds of others. But I'll tell you that often Jesus is found in the middle of the bad stuff that life dishes out for us. Death and illness and heartbreak and relational breakdown and car wrecks, you find Jesus. I spoke with a man who's been a Christian for a great many years who was in the hospital and 
recently, and as good a man as he is, he told me that since he was taken to the hospital, that he has been bound and determined to be a more dedicated Christian. He found God in the hospital. He found God in his illness. And let's go to the story, back to the story for a moment. They followed a star, these magi, and I want to read a few verses from this passage. Matthew 2, verse 1, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. Magi from the east, wise men, they're from the far east. They are maybe Asian, possibly. We have no reason to doubt that. Mystics, many translations call them astrologers. They studied the stars to see the future. They were religious men, but not in the way we are religious. They were not Jews. They were not Levites. They were pagans of a mystic religion. Verse 2, and asked, where is the one who, was, who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Somehow they had, had revealed to them that the king of the Jews had been born. How did they know that? I already posed that question. I still wonder, how did they know? Herod called them back and said, hey, when you find out where the king of the Jews is, let me know. I want to go worship him too. Yeah, right. They were told in a dream he had no intention of doing that. Herod wanted to kill the king of the Jews. But they went on their quest, and this was the result in Matthew 2, verse 9. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What did these guys find when they followed a star? They found a stable. We have so idealized the story of Christmas the birth of Jesus, I think sometimes we forget the shock value. You have these glorious signs in the heavens. This star that comes to rest over this place, which is probably something like a stable or a lean-to. Those of you in the country know what I'm talking about, a lean-to. And here's this child who is the king of the Jews followed these glorious signs to find a stable. No bright lights over the manger other than the star itself. In the midst of grave threats to the Son of God, and they fell down and they left gifts and they worshipped him and they understood something we would all do well to learn ourselves. Sometimes when you follow God's star, you end up at a stable. And there you will find Jesus. Some preacher wrote this, and I wanted to share it with you. He'd apparently run into his share of stables in ministry. <laughs> he talked about his, he'd gone to see his counselor, which I was so glad to see that a preacher had gone to see a counselor. A lot of us preachers need to see counselors. But anyway, it was indicative of his situation. He said, my counselor has finally forced me to face the fact that I'm a failure in my ministry. Permit me to list my demerits. I've never been to the Holy Land not even as a visitor, let alone a tour guide. I wince whenever I see those ads that say, go to the Holy Land in a religious magazine. My wife even stopped buying kosher hot dogs because they make me feel convicted. Every program I've ever started has failed. Our evangelism explosion didn't explode. It gave an embarrassed pop and rolled over and died. I attended a church growth seminar, and while I was gone, six families left the church. Whenever I try dial a prayer, I get the wrong number. I tried dial a meditation, and when the tape broke, and the tape broke after the first sentence, which was, so things are not going well today. Our church teams never win any games, basketball or softball. You name it, we've lost it. 
I'm thinking of sharing this with our church leaders, but they've ne they're never around when I phone, and all their letters to me are addressed to occupant. Now there's the picture of a guy who followed a star and found a stable. <laughs> what wise people do when they find a stable, though, meaning a difficulty, a life challenge, is you look for Jesus in that because he's there. He's there. Don't panic, the Lord is near. That's the theme today. The Lord is near. Don't lose hope. Rejoice in the Lord. God's doing something. We just need to seek what it is he's doing. The same man who wrote Philippians was in their city jail at one time in his life. Probably not too long before he wrote this letter. And he modeled this idea of rejoicing the Lord is near because he was thrown into a prison for, I mean, it, it was unjust, it was not fair, it was illegal. He was a Roman citizen. He was treated like an outcast in his own country. But instead of cursing his captors for jailing him unfairly, he and his buddy Silas rejoiced and sang hymns at the midnight hour in that musty dungeon. You see, he understands that when you follow the star, often you get to a stable. And while it may not look too promising on the outside, Jesus is there. And for Paul and Silas, he understood what it was like to rejoice because when you rejoice, you find Jesus. He's there. So when Paul says to rejoice in the Lord, let me tell you, that has some weight. This is a guy who sang in a prison. He followed the star and ended up in a cell. And the light dawns on those of us who understand that God's brightest lights shine in the darkest places at the darkest times. That's often where we see Jesus at the quiet moments of our suffering when we're in the stable. Rejoice because God is near. He's bringing the light. Although dim at first, it becomes brighter as we learn the purposes of God. As we go, we live our lives, and the older we get, the more you know this is true because you've tested him time and again. Rejoice. And there can be no peace on earth, at least no peace for us on earth, until we find that peace that passes understanding ourselves as individuals. Most of us who've lived any time at all know that life can be very, very difficult. And most of us know how reliable God has been in the most difficult times. And maybe you're still working through a difficult time. Actually, the merry-go-round doesn't stop for us either, does it? Chaos and difficulty follow us all the time. People tell me about folks who have died, folks that are sick. And yet, we rejoice. Why? Because in the midst of the stable, there's Jesus. He's always near. So if you want to give yourself, if you can accept, because it's been offered to you, the greatest gift, the greatest gift that you can receive is the gift of Christ. He's not coming as a baby the next time he returns. He's coming as the King of Kings. The great resurrection power for all of us who believe. And when we receive him, we receive life. This morning, we give you an opportunity to respond to that. He gives you life. He gives you grace. In the midst of your stable, which is your life, your difficulties, the star shines because Jesus is near. Jesus is near right now. You may find him on the outside. You're going to find him on the outside too, but he's here, and you can find him here too. You can find him through this invitation. Maybe you need to pray. You need to have us pray with you. We'd love to do that. Maybe you just need to say, Jesus, I don't belong to myself anymore. I am mine no more. 
We give you an opportunity to surrender your life and baptism to Jesus. If you'd like to place your stake with the Southside Church, we'd love for you to join us. And you can do that too at any time. You can do any of these things anytime. But right now, it's a great opportunity. As we stand and as Lee leads us, if you need to come, please do. Let's stand and sing.